what's happening to Netflix is not happening to other streamers. Um, okay. We have access to some very cool web analytics data that we reference all the time in our research. And that data showed that Netflix is indeed seeing a drop off in online engagement. App downloads are down, web traffic is down. The trends do not look good over there. Mm -hmm. When we look at other streaming platforms, subscription platforms, Spotify, mm -hmm. HBO Max, Apple TV, Disney Plus, Hulu, Roku Channel, Fubo TV, YouTube TV, the trends are not Netflix trends. The trends are actually continued to be very strong, very positive up and to the right. What's up, HGI investors, and welcome back to Hyper Growth Investing. I'm Aaron Davis, and as always, please be joined by the one, the only, Luke Lango. Luke, how are we doing today? Uh, it's it's a rough day today, Aaron. It's it's a rough day, and that's kind of where we think the market's heading right now. Flush out, then a melt up. So be prepared for a bit of a little bit of near term pain. Near term pain. Well, I guess I'm pain. looking forward to getting into that and all our topics in just a few moments. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, Hypergrowth Investing is the weekly podcast that picks the brain of investment analyst Luke. Lango. Each week, we will take an in-depth look at emerging tech and investment innovations, electric vehicles, cryptocurrencies, the metaverse, and more. Nothing is off limits. If you're joining us for the first time, we go up every Wednesday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you choose to listen to your favorite podcast. So make sure to like and subscribe to get Hyper Growth Investing as soon as it goes up. Again, I'm Aaron Davis, educator, lifelong learner, and your proxy into the mind that is the Luke Lango. We got a ton of things to cover, so let's dive right in. Um, so again, it's earnings season. Uh, one of the big news to come out of earnings season was uh, happened last week when Netflix reported uh, a loss of 200,000 subscribers. Uh, the mm -hmm. stock crashed on earnings last Wednesday, 35%, uh, and then uh, Pershing Square pulled all their stock out last Friday. Um, what went wrong here, Luke, with Netflix? And is this an indication of what's going to happen with other streaming stock streaming stocks uh what went wrong with netflix is a lack of innovation and well this is this indicative of a broader um contagion across the streaming industry the digital media industry the answer is no uh what happened in netflix is endemic to netflix it's a netflix problem so let's kind of dig into that um netflix has a long history a very impressive track record of robust innovation. They were the first to create a DVD by mail subscription service. That was a huge hit. Then they were the first to really pioneer solo streaming. That was a huge hit. Then they were the first to pioneer original content in the solo streaming world. That was a huge hit. So what you see is that the company has every four or five years, six or seven years sometimes, come up with some big new innovation that leapfrogs the platform, the service to a whole new playing field and creates enormous growth opportunities. That's Netflix's history. The problem is that we are now about six or seven years removed from the last big innovation for Netflix. The last big innovation was original content. Mm -hmm. That, it started in the earlier 2010s, but it really got rolling in 2016, summer 2016, with the Stranger Things phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Stranger Things was the sort of blockbuster original hit that at least on Wall Street solidified that Netflix's original content strategy was working. The stock went from like 80 to 120 after the Q3 earnings report that summer and then it was off to the races ever since then. So that was 2016, mm -hmm. 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. Here we are six, seven years removed from that Mm -hmm. And what has Netflix done? They've continued to pound the table on original content, which is great, but they haven't done anything else. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the fact that there are a lot of competitors coming to the market doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. HBO Max has original content. Disney Plus has original content. Apple TV Plus has original content. Even free ones like the Roku channel have original content. Mm -hmm. So 
all these new competitors are coming into the streaming space and they're doing the exact same thing as Netflix, making original content. So Netflix no longer is on a higher playing field. Everybody's on Netflix's playing field. Mm -hmm. Now, what Netflix traditionally does is they come up with some innovation that leapfrogs them onto a new playing field and then the rest of the industry plays catch up. But right now, they're not doing that. And as a result, they are just swamped in competition Mm -hmm. and they are losing subscribers. They are especially losing subscribers domestically where all of the services I just mentioned are very easily accessible. So this is a big problem for Netflix. They need to think of some big breakthrough Mm -hmm. that's going to recharge the growth narrative. Is that going to be an ad-supported version? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Reed Hastings sounds open to that, but I'm skeptical that's really a breakthrough innovation. That's more of a concession, if anything. So Mm -hmm. I would not hang my hat on that being the breakthrough for Netflix to recharge the growth narrative. Could it be gaming, interactive content, virtual augmented reality stuff? That one's a bit more promising, but Netflix hasn't really shown much traction there. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when they had that. Do you watch Black Mirror, Aaron? Yep. Yep. Um, Yeah, the episode where you could kind of choose your own adventure style. Yeah, yeah. So it was a movie. And I Mm -hmm. remember when that came out and I was super excited about it. This could be big for Netflix, but they never really went anywhere. I mean, there's a couple of interactive shows and movies on there, Mm -hmm. but it's not not the widespread phenomenon that original content is. So there's promise there, potential there, but Netflix doesn't seem to be executing uh, on that vertical um, all that well. International expansion, as you can see, that's also drying up. You can look at the numbers. So that's really not a breakthrough. But point being is Netflix needs a breakthrough to recharge the growth narrative because they're just becoming another commoditized streaming, not commoditized, but just another streaming service Mm -hmm. in a universe of lots of streaming services. So this is a Netflix problem and it's a big problem. So but go ahead so with with you say that you know all these other streaming services have kind of caught up to netflix but it is a relatively level playing field as of right now is there any streaming services that are uh supplementing that innovation that netflix isn't right now i know you do have um a streaming service that you're very bullish about i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and why yeah so there there are yeah so i i before we get into that i think it's very important to note that What's happening to Netflix is not happening to other streamers. Um, okay. We have access to some very cool web analytics data that we reference all the time in our research. And that data showed that Netflix is indeed seeing a drop off in online engagement. App downloads are down. Web traffic is down. The trends do not look good over there. Mm-hmm. When we look at other streaming platforms, subscription platforms, Spotify, Mm -hmm. HBO Max, Apple TV, Disney Plus, Hulu, Roku Channel, Fubo TV, YouTube TV. The trends are not Netflix trends. The trends are actually continued to be very strong, very positive up and to the right. So based on that data alone, we're very confident in saying that what's happening to Netflix is not happening across the whole digital media sphere. Indeed, Snapchat snap reported earnings last week Mm -hmm. and they added 13 million users in the quarter that's the same number of daily active users that they added in a quarter that's the same cadence that they have had been that they've been adding users for the past six quarters Mm -hmm. so snaps user growth trajectory digital engagement is not falling like netflix's Mm -hmm. netflix has a netflix problem not a digital media problem. Okay. So other media, digital media platforms are not falling victim to the same thing that Netflix is falling victim to. In the streaming space, yes, what we want to see is that original content has become somewhat commoditized. So mm-hmm. we want to look for companies, streamers, that are doing something beyond that. They're going above and beyond original content and they're building new features, new value adds for subscribers. And a company that is doing that that we think is pretty cool is Fubo TV. Mm-hmm. Fubo yeah. TV is trying to be a sports focused streamer that is integrating sports betting. So their vision is to have a all in one integrated sports betting and watching platform. 
Mm-hmm. You can be at home, watch the game, have six or seven games up, all the European soccer games, maybe an MLB game, maybe an NBA game. You have them all going on, and you have a little dashboard in the middle where you can place bets and you can track stats mm-hmm. and you can make or lose money. That is a unique platform. That is a massive differentiator. Fubo TV is admittedly still a ways away from fully developing that platform, Mm -hmm. but they are making inroads. They are getting licenses. They are acquiring all the sports content. They are, they've already launched their sports book. They have multiple picture and picture viewing experiences. The platform is making steps towards becoming that. And if Fubo TV uh, succeeds in building that platform, that's a platform that could easily have 10, 15, 20 million subscribers in the U S alone that are very sticky and spend a lot of money on it and fubo tv will make a lot of revenues off that subscriber base at pretty high margin so if they succeed the the upside potential there is pretty attractive that's a streaming stock that's worth a look here netflix is not i think you got to pass on netflix and look for other options elsewhere i mean even even something like disney i think is better at this point something like apple is better at this point netflix is just kind of over the hill and until they find that breakthrough innovation to really propel them to the next stage of growth it's going to be dead money so you talk about how fubo has this almost interactive nature within the the service built in and around it and whereas netflix as we've already discussed is you know just content delivery it's just delivering you the sometimes original content, sometimes licensed content. Is interactivity the the route that streaming services you see trending moving forward? I think or? it should be. Mm-hmm. I, think it, I think as VR technology continues to advance, that should definitely be the way that um, streamers pivot, okay. no doubt. I think that as headsets become more of a ubiquity, there is potential, and maybe some people will argue with this, but there's potential for in five years, headsets to be what smartphones are today. So everyone has a smartphone today. In five years, everyone's going to have a headset at their mm-hmm. house. Um, and if not not smartphones, then they're at least the new gaming consoles. Mm-hmm. So they'll be in 40%, 50% of homes in the U.S. In that world, it makes absolute sense for these streamers to build enormous catalogs of interactive content to um, integrate with those VR headsets. I think that is definitely the route that these streamers should be looking to go. It looked like Netflix was trying that, maybe pull back from it. I'm not sure why, but I think that's a route they should more aggressively pursue if they're looking to recharge their growth, which they obviously are. Awesome. Well, continue, continuing the conversation in regards to earnings season, uh, this week is kind of the tech earnings reports. Uh, what mm-hmm. else are you seeing so far this earnings season, and what are you ex- expecting with the rest of this week? Well, I think the problem with earnings season, Aaron, is that it's colliding with a super hawkish Fed. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked about this before. What determines a stock price? Earnings per share times the PE multiple equals stock price. So Mm -hmm. you have two drivers here, EPS and PE multiple. Now, when you have earnings season, you're going to get some read on EPS, whether EPS should move higher or lower, depending on if companies are beating, missing, meeting. Companies are beating. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're beating by pretty good amounts, around 7 8% on average. So the EPS number is going higher. I mean, uh-huh. it should go higher. Companies are guiding positive, too. There's a lot of positive stuff in the earnings season. But it's colliding against a super hawkish Fed that has put the 10-year Treasury yield up to about 3%. It's pulled back over the past couple days to about 2.8 percent but i mean it's, it's way elevated okay we were at 1.9 exiting last year so we're we've gained 100 basis points plus pretty scary so it's colliding with that which is bringing the p multiple down so there's been so much compression or there needs to be so much compression in the p multiple that earnings needed to be really really good to offset the multiple compression to set the stage for stocks to rally and what you're getting is earnings are good but not good enough not enough positive magnitude here to really offset the multiple compression to set the stage for a stock rally so stocks are not doing well Mm -hmm. during earnings season so far it also hurts when the the big boys when the mega caps don't perform well Mm -hmm. netflix obviously had a horrible quarter we're going to hear from google microsoft amazon so we'll see 
over the next two weeks, the tune could completely change because you mm-hmm. got to remember we still have a lot of earnings season left. There mm-hmm. is a lot of ball, a lot of game left um, uh, in this earnings season. So what we want to do is wait and see how the rest of the companies report. But thus far, earnings season has been good but not great. We needed great. In the absence of great, stocks are struggling. Mm-hmm. And that's earnings season in a nutshell so far. I know you mentioned uh, last week this divergence phenomenon you discussed. Uh, just want to kind of check in with that research and how you're monitoring how that progress, is, how that coincides with the current earnings that you're seeing right now. Um, yeah, so we are very, I mean, I was up till 2 a.m. last night, 2.30 a.m., um, <laughs> working on the divergence phenomenon because it is a phenomenon that we are exceptionally excited about. And just to recap for those uh, who are new to this podcast or this show or whatever we call it these days, I don't know, I'm not not cool. Um, The divergence is based on the simple idea that over time, the company is the stock and the stock is the company. So if a company is growing very quickly, its revenues and its earnings are trending higher, the stock price too will trend higher higher the correlation there is very strong between revenues and price it's 0.88 between earnings and price it's 0.93 so you're talking about a 90 percent positive correlation very strong correlation Mm -hmm. every once in a while though you get a divergence in this correlation you get a break in this correlation Mm -hmm. where the company is not the stock and the stock is not the company you get brief moments in time where that is true Mm -hmm. that normally happens when There's periods of macroeconomic fear, Mm -hmm. periods of recession fears, uh, periods of elevated volatility where people start acting irrationally and markets start believing that these companies that are growing very quickly are going to stop growing. But if they don't stop growing, then what you have is this enormous divergence opportunity where revenues and earnings continue to go higher. The Mm -hmm. stock price drops. And everyone notices a couple months on, wait, those revenues and earnings are are still going up. Maybe this stock, you know, let's buy the stock. Mm -hmm. You get a massive convergence, a massive snapback. These are rare opportunities in the market. We've seen them happen three times over the past 35, 40 years. Mm -hmm. We believe one is emerging right now. And we're hard at work trying to identify the opportunities in that divergence phenomenon, that divergence window. How does earnings season play into this? Well, the companies that we are following for this divergence phenomenon are reporting fabulous earnings. Okay. So their earnings trend line, their revenues trend line is continuing to go up and to the right. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, their stocks are selling off with sympathy, in sympathy with the rest of the market mm-hmm. and are going down. So the divergence is getting bigger. The bigger this divergence gets, our analysis shows, the bigger the snapback will be. Mm-hmm. That there is a clear correlation in all the divergence examples we found over the past 35 years the di- more divergent a stock is, mm-hmm. stock price from its fundamental growth trend line, the quicker it snaps back and the bigger the returns are in that snapback. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, Amazon was super divergent in 2001. Mm-hmm. This is a stock that dropped 92, 93, 95%, maybe it was more, dropped more than 90% from 2000 to 2001. Absolutely got crushed. And Its revenues at that time continued to soar, absolutely soar. That was one of the biggest divergences ever. And it resulted in enabling you to buy Amazon stock at like five or six dollars. Mm-hmm. And what it you know it was a thirty three hundred dollar stock not too long ago. So we're talking about generationally strong buying opportunities here. And we believe something like that is happening right now. And we're monitoring the data very closely to see when exactly is this window going to open? When are we going to bottom out? When's the Mm -hmm. snapback going to begin? But the divergence is here. And Mm -hmm. that is a really promising setup for long-term investors. Are there any upcoming earnings that you're going to be looking at closely for the rest of earnings season? I look at all the earnings, Aaron. I look at all the earnings. Okay. No, they're all, they're all important, especially yeah. this time around. You want to look at tech to see, okay, is, is there a pull forward of demand? Or was there a pull forward of demand 
are they're continuing to grow at the rates that analysts expect them to. You got to watch the tech earnings. You got to watch the consumer spending earnings. You got to see consumer discretionary and consumer staples. Consumer discretionary is important because you want to see, okay, is the consumer so afraid that they're not spending? Because consumer sentiment keeps dropping. It's at mm-hmm. super low levels, yet consumer spending has remained pretty strong. So you want to watch consumer discretionary earnings to see how is the consumer spending during this time. Despite what their sentiment may be, what are their spending trends looking like? Look at consumer staples to see, okay, those are the folks that should have the most pricing power. They should be able to absorb inflation the most, pass on uh, those costs the most. They should be able to preserve their margins the most. Is that true? If not, probably worrisome for everybody else. So you got to look across. You want to watch the oil companies, Mm -hmm. right? The oil stocks. How are they reporting earnings right now? What is their outlook? Are they building more – Sorry, are they expanding their their production out? Is that going to impact supply? So across the board, this earnings season is very important to the market, regardless of what you're invested in, because it's all interconnected. And right now we're in exceptionally volatile times, meaning everything counts. Everything matters. So when you ask me, are there any earnings I'm, I'm looking for, I'm paying attention to, uh, it's all of them, Aaron. Really, it's all of them right now. Awesome. Well, uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, there, I know there's a few things that popped up in the news that you wanted to talk about. Uh, Match Group sure. uh, gains on some speculation that it could be a potential target for Meta. Uh, I assume you have yeah. some thoughts on this. Uh, I, I think Facebook should buy Match. Okay. Um, I'm going to say Facebook, not Meta, because I'm I'm old school, <laughs> I guess. Well, in that um, case, I should, we should say that Match is equivalent is the the owner of Tinder. So, yes, Match. Well, so yeah. So for context, Match owns Tinder. Match owns Match, obviously. Match yeah. owns Hinge, which is the most popular dating site these days or dating mm-hmm. app. Um, Match owns Plenty of Fish. Match owns OK Cupid. Match oh, Match has monopolized the online dating scene. Uh, okay. There's Bumble, and that's about the only property they don't own. Gotcha. So Match has monopolized that. Facebook has tried to make a play into online dating for several years now. Each foray has been unsuccessful. They have some sort um, of like dating thing on their on there now right uh i mean they might they may not i don't know honestly i i've kind of fallen asleep on their dating efforts because it's been like five years of them saying they're gonna do something they've launched things and they've all mm-hmm. been unsuccessful so it's kind of like it's the boy who cried wolf at this point okay. like they yeah. have proven to be unsuccessful in creating an online dating thing they're not going to be successful in doing so mm-hmm. but they want to do so so how should they go about it acquire the leading online dating player right Mm -hmm. that's what they did with instagram that's what they did with whatsapp Mm -hmm. zuckerberg has a history of acquisitions and turning those acquisitions into empires you know match kind of fits that wheelhouse and so i think facebook really if they're looking to recharge their growth narrative like netflix big tech is kind of really wobbly right now then they need to do something pretty aggressive this would be an aggressive move that i think would be very value additive for facebook and match is pretty cheap right now, mm-hmm. pretty cheap. So Facebook could swoop it, uh, swoop in and buy out the company at a big discount, and that would allow them to have really, you know, make basically make a very accretive acquisition. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a very positive thing for Facebook shareholders and match shareholders. I think that's a marriage that should happen. One of the one of the things that happened obviously over the pandemic was that a lot of we couldn't go out, especially towards the beginning of it. I know that I went on a few. Uh, happy hour ring central dates during the time does this kind of narrative uh segue into metaverse dating as opposed to -to face-to-face dating or is that just something kind of kitschy moving forward yeah i mean i'm very sure that zuckerberg and company want to make metaverse dating a big thing believe it will be a big thing and match is doing that match is the only online dating company that is even looking into metaverse dating really Mm -hmm. so match has they've dipped their toes in that water yes i think that's another reason why facebook and match would make a great cup why facebook would be very interested Mm -hmm. in acquiring match basically take match take all those assets take that leadership all those users combine it with everything facebook is doing in terms of vr Mm -hmm. and boom create a brand new breakthrough metaverse dating experience that they probably believe is going to be the next big thing well be the next big thing I don't know. Metaverse dating is a little bit intangible to me, but mm-hmm. 
I think it's it's a strong belief. Obviously, they renamed the company Meta, so they're yeah. going to do everything Metaverse. Um, and Metaverse dating is what a lot of people believe has, has huge potential. So it makes a ton of sense, a ton of sense for Facebook to go out and buy Match. If not today, within 2022, within 2023, we think it makes a lot of sense. Gotcha. Another, uh, another article that kind of popped on our radar, uh, Plug Power and to deal with Walmart. Is Plug Stock a buy now? Um, is this partnership a big deal? Uh, is this a sign of more to come with Plug? Uh, yes, it's definitely a big deal, and it's definitely a sign of more to come with Plug Power. Plug Power is the leading hydrogen fuel cell maker in the world. They've, they started by making hydrogen fuel cells for forklifts because mm -hmm. forklifts are a certain type of vehicle where hydrogen power makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You need uh, constant uptime, you need quick recharge, you need constant power output. So that's an, an arena where hydrogen fuel cells make it made a lot of sense. And so high, that's where plug power got its start, building hydrogen fuel cells for forklifts. And in the early days, they signed partnerships with Amazon, with mm -hmm. Walmart, with basically all the big boys in the forklift industry. Mm -hmm. So Plug Power and Walmart have had a relationship for years now. But recently, Plug Power has expanded its operations dramatically. Mm -hmm. They said hydrogen fuel cells that was for forklifts, that was just the start. That's the tip of the iceberg. We want to build a hydrogen powerhouse. And that includes a big part of that is hydrogen production, specifically green hydrogen production. Green mm -hmm. hydrogen is hydrogen produced from renewable energies. So Plug Power has really aggressively invested in becoming the green hydrogen production leader in the United States and in Europe and in Asia. They're trying to be this global green hydrogen producing giant. Validation of those huge investments mm -hmm. has been scant so far, but Walmart is a major first validation of that. Okay. Walmart basically said, hey, Plug Power, making all these green hydrogen facilities, we want to buy that green hydrogen. We don't just want to buy your hydrogen fuel cells for our forklifts. You want to power those forklifts with your green hydrogen. Gotcha. That's the dream for Plug Power, right? Okay. Plug okay. Power wants to sell you hydrogen fuel cells and then sell, sell you the hydrogen. actual fuel, the actual fuel. hydrogen yeah. to power those fuel cells, right? So it's a massive deal for Plug Power, mm -hmm. a massive deal. And I think it's a sign of more to come. Walmart and Plug Power were the first to start the hydrogen fuel cell forklift mm -hmm. um, trend. Now they're the first to start the green hydrogen uh, buying and selling trend. So I think that over the next several years, Plug Power is in a very strong position to not just sell a lot of hydrogen fuel cells to a lot of different companies, but also sell green hydrogen to all those companies as well. And that creates a massive business with massive revenues, massive margins. Love that stock long term. Mm -hmm. Think it's the next Tesla or the Tesla of hydrogen, if you will. Okay. So plug power stock, strong buy from me, very mm -hmm. strong buy from me. Well, continuing the trend of alternative energy, I want to talk a little bit about the what's going on with the solar tariff probe. Uh, essentially, from what I gather, is that U.S. regulators are planning to probe into uh, solar tariff compliance in Asian factories. Um, yep. As a result, the solar markets are down, uh, and there's you know this ongoing investigation as to whether these companies are purposely evading tariffs. Um, what is your you know? Long-term and short-term implications of this? Much ado about nothing. Okay. Quote Shakespeare. <laughs> um, the story is, is that in the early days of the solar industry, the world quickly learned that China can make solar panels much more cheaply than the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so... Back in the early 2010s, there were some complaints among U.S. solar panel manufacturers that, hey, we can't compete with these Chinese solar panel makers. They're being subsidized by the government. They have cheap labor and they're just dumping all their solar panels in the U.S. We're getting completely screwed here. Mm -hmm. So the Obama administration back in 2012 heard those complaints and in 2013 slap down some pretty big tariffs on Chinese solar imports. End of story, right? Yep. No, because what happened is that <laughs> instead of the Chinese so the ch Chinese solar panels going from China to the US, basically they went all down to Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. 
solar panels were made in Southeast Asia, and mm-hmm. then they went to the U.S. Okay. That's textbook circumvention. That's okay. just textbook tariff circumvention. But it's been going on for years, and no one's really – cared all that much about it because at the end of the day we want to advance clean energy Mm -hmm. we want cheaper solar we want cheaper clean energy so like net net it was it was a positive so nobody really complained about it all that much outside of a few u.s solar panel manufacturers but in early 2022 there's this tiny company and i'm forgetting the name of it now because it's a company i'd never heard of you'd never heard of no one's ever heard of a tiny solar panel manufacturer in california brought the complaint to to the department of commerce of this tariff circumvention Uh and the department of commerce agreed to look at it so basically over the next year the department of commerce is going to investigate tariff circumvention when it comes to solar panels of chinese solar panel manufacturers basically just diverting their resources to southeast asia and then sending those into the u.s Uh will they find something probably (laughs) okay will anything happen of it probably not Uh mm-hmm Who's, who's the president of the United States right now, Aaron Davis? The president of the United States right now is Joe Biden. And what does Joe Biden love more than anything? <laughs> I don't know. Solar. Solar. Joe, Joe Biden solar. and his administration, solar. the White House, <laughs> the government, they love solar. Mm-hmm. Love solar. On their watch, they will not allow anything dramatically harming to Mm -hmm. the solar industry to happen um, as a result of this investigation. So even if the Department of Commerce comes back with some findings, I believe the tariffs that will be slapped down will be very small. Mm -hmm. And I actually think the Department of Commerce will come back with nothing and there will be no tariffs slapped down at all. So – what does this create from an investment perspective? Mm-hmm. Solar stocks have been crushed as a result of this investigation. The investigation is cr- causing a lot of solar projects in the United States to get delayed, to get postponed into 23. Mm-hmm. That means these companies are in for a rough 22, no doubt. Revenues are going to get hurt. Margins are going to get hurt. Earnings are going to get hurt. It's going to be a tough year for them. But it's setting up for what will be a massive breakout 23 when the Department of Commerce comes back. No findings. No new tariffs. All those delayed projects come back online and you get a boom, 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 boom in the solar industry. Solar Mm -hmm. stocks are going to roar. So when's the time to buy solar stocks? Markets are forward looking. Mm -hmm. They're discounting mechanisms. These stocks are already dirt cheap. There could, there's a really strong case to be made for getting into solar stocks now, for getting mm-hmm. into solar stocks in May, getting into solar stocks in June and July before the turnaround materializes and while these stocks are still very cheap. So I think you got to get into solar now. There's a lot of names in the industry. If you don't know the differences between of them, there's upstream players, there's downstream players. If you don't know the differences, you can just go ahead and buy the uh, solar ETF. TAN is the ticker, T-A-N. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great way to play this. But yeah, I really like solar here. I think the setup is pretty attractive. With this uh, downtrend happening right now across solar, uh, does this have a trickle-down effect to other uh, alternative energy sectors such as energy storage? Oh, absolutely. EVs? Yeah. yeah, energy storage is huge, right? Because energy storage projects are coupled with solar energy projects. What is the number one need for battery energy storage systems? It's to back up solar power, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So if solar power projects are getting delayed, that means – battery energy storage projects are also getting delayed um so it does have a trickle down effect absolutely that means there are also some pretty compelling opportunities in the energy storage space right we love the energy storage space Mm -hmm. we think that that is going to be the biggest growth industry of the 2020s near-term headwind for sure but long-term looks super positive there we love a lot of those stocks they've been really crushed we think there's some huge upside potential in those names Great. Uh, Shifting gears a little bit, uh, you know, with uh, the way the last few years have been, uh, there's this kind of need, I think, that people have to want to travel. What is your outlook for for travel this summer? And again, what's the investment implication that you're seeing in that sector? Right. Yeah. So travel boom, summer 2022. We definitely think that is going to happen. No doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the reality is is that nobody traveled in 2020 a mm-hmm. lot of us traveled in 2021 a lot of us didn't travel in 2021 mm-hmm. and now 2022 is really the first year that most Americans have put the pandemic in the rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. It's the first year that most Americans are acting completely normal without masks, mm-hmm. without social distancing. Um, so this is going to be the first summer since 2019 that's going to be, you know, 90% plus normal. Um, and as a result, we think there is a lot of pent up demand to travel and that there is going to be a travel boom throughout the summer. Mm-hmm. Not to mention weddings. Mm-hmm. Weddings are a huge thing here. Mm-hmm. A lot of people got engaged in 2019. They postponed their weddings in 2020. They postponed their weddings in 2021 because here's the thing. When you have a wedding, you got 100 people, you're a little bit more careful about mm-hmm. the COVID protocols. You know, if you had a wedding in March 21 or April 21 or May 21. So a lot of people did have weddings. A lot of people postponed. Regardless, 2022 is shaping up to be a record year for the wedding season. I read some statistic that was like, I think the average 40, uh, average woman under the age of 40 in the U.S. will attend three weddings this year. I've got, That's two, I've got two next month. <laughs> you got two next month. You have a lot of friends. Well, there you go. So <laughs> these weddings, they obviously are a big boon for yeah. travel demand. So I think that that plays into this um, travel boom as well. Net net, I think that the twenty summer twenty two is going to be a big year for the travel industry. You're already seeing that with uh, TSA thoroughput numbers. You're seeing traffic at airports is back to levels that it was at in twenty twenty two. This is the first or in twenty nineteen. Sorry, mm-hmm. um, this is the first time we've rebounded to pre pandemic levels ever Mm -hmm. um we didn't do it in 2020 obviously in 2021 (laughs) we didn't do it Mm -hmm. and early 2022 we kind of did it but we really started to get back to pre-pandemic levels around march and april of 2022 Mm -hmm. now importantly the bear thesis here right is that well airfares are getting insanely expensive because gas prices are insanely high Mm -hmm. true but high gas prices be damned you know, <laughs> Americans are going to travel this summer. Yeah. yeah, I've talked to a lot of people. It's like, OK, you know, the flight's 800 as opposed to 600. Oh, well, yeah, I got to get out of here, man. Yeah. I got to get I, I got to get to a beach. I got to get mm-hmm. to the city. I got to get out of here, man. So I think that there is just so much pent up demand that that's going to offset those higher gas prices. Mm-hmm. Not to mention that's pretty much what all the CEOs of these tech company or of these um, airline companies have been saying. Mm-hmm. Uh We got earnings from Delta. We got them from United. We got them from Alaska. We got them from American. Mm -hmm. And everybody's saying, hey, um, we're not seeing demand fall off at all because Mm -hmm. of higher gas prices. We're not seeing it fall off at all because of the war in Ukraine. We're not seeing it fall off at all because of COVID-19 lockdowns in China. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, to be clear, we think there is definitely a distinction here between global travel and domestic travel. We are not terribly bullish on global travel. We do think that the longer it drags on, the more the war in Ukraine will negatively impact European travel. Mm -hmm. And the more severe and widespread lockdowns get in China, the more it will weigh on Asian travel demand. Mm -hmm. So we're not terribly bullish on global travel demand, but we are entirely bullish on domestic travel demand. Mm -hmm. We don't think those issues impact Americans' willingness to travel from city to city or state to state or national park to national park. So as a result, we think the best way to play this boom is to buy stocks with domestic travel exposure Mm -hmm. by the domestic airline operators maybe by some airport owners buy stocks that are in that wheelhouse we think those have some pretty good potential in the summer we think they're going to work even if the market doesn't Mm -hmm. work and that's pretty attractive considering the market (laughs) i see a lot of red in that screen right now (laughs) yeah everything's red except for the uh the oil and gas industry right now it looks like yep (laughs) Wonderful. Yep, there you are. All right. Um, uh, we'll continuing the conversation of traveling away from a place, namely our homes. Uh, I want to touch again on something that you uh, we talk about a lot, uh, and again, it impacts everybody, whether you're a homeowner or a prospective buyer. You know, people want to know where the housing market is headed. Uh, you've laid out a bull case in 
past episodes. Um, but I want to know what your response is to some of the points that bears are making and why you believe that the risk that they're kind of stating is overstated. Um, one of the arguments mm -hmm. is, you know, home prices are up 19.2%. Um, and again, just relatively speaking, what you pay for a mortgage is going up. The cost of a home is just a lot more than it was in the past. Right. So we're talking about why that's not going to cause a crash? Yeah. Uh, the most important driver of the housing market is supply. Demand is durable in the housing market. Historically speaking, spiking mortgage rates have never caused the housing market to crash. Mm -hmm. They just don't. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're looking to buy a home and mortgage rates go up, you're still looking to buy a home. You mm -hmm. just have shifted down your affordability a little bit. Okay? Mm-hmm. But you're still in the market to buy a home. Demand is not impacted by higher mortgage rates, and history bears that out. Again, higher mortgage rates have never led to a housing market crash, have never led to a precipitous drop in home prices. It doesn't happen. History is crystal clear on that. And again, the reason for that is because demand is durable. People want to buy homes. This is not price sensitive. I am buying this home for 10, 15, 20 years. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. It's not a purchase. Therefore, I'm willing to extend myself a little bit here. What does drive housing market declines is supply. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear here. Home prices, more so than pretty much any other financial asset, go up over time. Mm -hmm. They go from the bottom left to the upper right with a very steady cadence and they very rarely very rarely go through periods of two three or four quarters in a row where home prices drop uh -huh. that almost never happens a prolonged decline of more than two quarters of declines in home prices almost never happens uh -huh. but when it does happen it happens exclusively as a result of soaring supply okay what happens is that demand runs super hot so supply starts ramping the builders get really excited about all that demand they start building and building and building and building and building until they reach a point of overbuilding. then the economy gets a little bit wobbly demand pitter patters a little bit or maybe demand doesn't pitter patter it doesn't matter when you overbuild so much mm -hmm. supply then expands to huge levels whoopsies oh <laughs> my smoothie <laughs> whatever that's what happens. We'll clean that up later. Um, <laughs> so where was I? Supply Housing demand. market supply. We have supply, supply expands so much mm -hmm. that when demand does fall even a little – then the market absolutely crashes. So mm -hmm. the thing you got to watch in the housing market is supply. Okay. Um, when I look at the supply right now, I see the most supply constrained housing market ever. Mm -hmm. Inventory is super low. Month supply of homes is two months, meaning it would take two months to clear all the 60 days, just mm -hmm. 60 days to clear all the homes in the market. Mm -hmm. That's unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. We are in the most supply constrained market of all time. So how do you fix this issue? How do you stabilize home prices? Well, you got to bring supply back up. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? You need new home construction mm -hmm. because existing homeowners can't do it. Everybody who sells a home becomes a buyer. So you get one unit of supply, one unit of demand. It mm -hmm. offsets. In order to just increase supply without increasing demand, you need new home construction. Now, unfortunately, what happened is we have a decades-long problem in the making. 2008 hit. Everybody got scared of owning a home. Everybody got scared of mortgages. Everybody got scared of loans. Home builders got scared of building. Mm -hmm. So for a decade, for 15 years, home builders in the U.S. under built mm -hmm. the, the cadence of housing starts from 2008 to 2021 basically was you know 500,000 to 1.7 1.8 million whereas in the decade leading up to the 06 housing crash 
home builders were building at a cadence of 1.5 to 2.5 million. So mm-hmm. we're talking about a decade of underbuilding that has led to the tightest supply constrained market, housing market of all time. This is not going to fix itself because mortgage rates spike. Mm-hmm. Okay, you need more supply and that more supply has to come through a decade of overbuilding. That's what needs to happen right now. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, for prospective home buyers, that cannot happen. Home builders are dealing with significant labor shortages. Mm -hmm. You heard of the great resignation. Well, that is most acutely impacting physical labor industries because Mm -hmm. everybody thinks they're too good for physical labor these days. Mm -hmm. So people are quitting physical labor jobs. The construction industry alone is seeing a huge worker shortage. So home builders simply do not have the labor to overbuild right now. Mm -hmm. Supply shortages, lumber is the most critical ingredient to building a home. Lumber is in a huge supply disruption, supply chain disruption right now. Mm -hmm. So home builders not only don't have enough labor to overbuild, they don't have enough supplies to overbuild. Mm -hmm. Not to mention Home builders aren't just sitting on tons of cash to go out and buy land and build homes. They're financing home building with debt, meaning if interest rates go up, their cost to build homes also goes up and they can build fewer homes with the same amount of cash. Mm -hmm. So home builders are looking at a situation right now where due to labor shortages, supply chain disruptions and higher financing costs, they cannot overbuild Mm -hmm. so who's going to fix the supply equation we don't see that we don't see the supply equation getting fixed we think that demand does pitter patter a little but again we don't think demand is going to really take that big of a hit because Mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is there are so many freaking people who want to buy a home right now so many that got priced out of the market and are now just waiting Mm mm-hmm Right in their nails, chomping at the bit for the first sign of a slowdown, and they're going to rush right in and buy it. Mm-hmm. I think there was something, every, like a Redfin report, every home seller, for every home seller, there were eight or nine home buyers. Mm-hmm. Like that means that every time a home is sold, mm-hmm. there are seven or eight people, families that didn't get that home that are now still they're in the market. For a home. Where are those people going? Mm-hmm. Are they just going to disappear now because of higher mortgage rates? Mm-hmm. No. They're still here. They still want a home. So as soon as you see any sort of plateauing, any mm-hmm. sort of come down in prices, that demand's coming right back into the market. Not to mention you have massive demographic tailwinds here. Mm-hmm. Millennials, they were part of that. Oh, they saw 08 happen. They got freaked out. They didn't want to own a home, but now they do. 15 mm-hmm. years later, they're ready to own a home. They're married. Maybe they got kids. They have great jobs. They have 401ks. They're mm-hmm. comfy. It's time to get a home, okay? So that is a huge demographic tale and a huge generation of buyers that now want to own a home. Not to mention the baby boomers. They're retiring. Time to downsize. I don't want to maintain the lawn anymore, mm-hmm. okay? Let me get into a smaller home. That's a whole nother generation of buying demand here. So when I look at it, yes, the housing market in no way in H-E double hockey sticks Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. this market going to sustain 20% plus price growth. Mm -hmm. That's unsustainable. But also no way in H-E double hockey sticks is this market going to crash. Okay. What we're going to see in 2022 is a moderation of prices a slowdown in sales. You'll probably get price growth in a four to six percent range. You'll probably see a five to ten percent pullback in unit sales, mm-hmm. followed by twenty three, which will be another year four to six percent growth, and then a bounce back in unit sales by five to ten percent. And thereafter, you're probably going to get a very stable market that is growing at mid single digits in both unit sales and price. This is the start of a steady bull market in housing not the top of a, of, of a bubble. Mm-hmm. That's how we look at it. Housing stocks look very attractive to us from that perspective because they are being priced for an apocalyptic situation mm-hmm. that simply is not going to materialize. And when it does not materialize, those stocks are going to absolutely roar. And based on your supply thesis, where it's going to sustain itself for quite a while. It took a decade of underbuilding to get here. It's going to take a decade of overbuilding to get out. And 
home builders can't start on that overbuilding until the current supply chain labor shortage situations improve. And this is why, Aaron, if I can throw a little plug in here. <laughs> Always. This is, this is one of the reasons we're super bullish on 3D printing. Okay. Because there's a company called Icon, and they 3D print homes. I've, I've, seen the, I've seen a few videos on them, yeah. And we think that is a super interesting technology here. Right now, we're all about, let's find tech that solves problems, right? Mm -hmm. The world's got problems right now. Tech can solve them. Let's yeah. find the tech that does solve them. 3D printing is that. I mean, you look at the home builders. We just talked about why they cannot overbuild. They don't have the labor. They mm -hmm. don't have the supplies. Hello, 3D printer. Yeah. If, if I don't have the labor, I can get one 3D printer, one yeah. massive 3D printer that just basically with cement, which is not in short supply, mm -hmm. just builds dozens upon dozens of homes. The costs are way lower. The time is way faster. Mm -hmm. That is a way to easily scale up home building in the face of labor and supply chain, uh, labor shortages and supply chain disruption. So that's one of the reasons we're actually really bullish on 3D printing. Um, in the housing market, because we mm -hmm. think it is a critical technology to solving the massive housing problem we have right now. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, to, like, to be honest, the, as high as home prices are right now, that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? It's a problem. There are companies that are benefiting from it, but it's a problem. Yeah. When you have the most overpaid generation in human history, mm -hmm. millennials, and to an extension, you know, the older Gen Zers, the most overpaid generation in history cannot afford a home. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. Yeah. So we have a problem that needs to get fixed. 3D printing can solve that problem. And honestly, I think it's the only way we do solve that problem. Unless everybody decides they want to become a construction worker all of a sudden. <laughs> Which, given the current state of things, I don't think that's going to happen. Mm. Well, uh, 3D printing, awesome. Uh, going into our big three market check-in, uh, kind of just want to touch base on, the, on those three real quick, the big three. Uh, China, Fed, inflation. Um, I know that, you know, for the past few weeks when we've talked about China, uh, you've been pretty, you know, nonchalant with some of the lockdowns, but the lockdowns have kind of have continued uh, a little bit more widespread than initially thought. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, China is bringing down the hammer. China mm -hmm. is absolutely bringing down the hammer. Shanghai has stayed locked down. Beijing's mass testing looks like it's going to get into a Shanghai type lockdown pretty soon. Mm -hmm. China's bringing down the hammer. So we got to we got to shift the base case assumption to China is going to be in lockdown sporadically for the ne in a pretty severe lockdown sporadically for the foreseeable future, at mm -hmm. least for through summer. Yeah. Um, and probably into fall and winter. Right. I mean, if they're locking down like this in spring. Yeah. What are they going to look like in fall and winter? Mm hmm. So um, it's it's pretty pretty worrisome. Uh, exposure to Chinese stocks definitely want to mitigate that right now. Mm -hmm. Definitely worrisome. A lot of supply chains over there. That's also worrisome. So you di we have to monitor that risk as it happens. The one positive here is that what it should do is it should moderate demand in a meaningful way, global demand, mm -hmm. and it should bring treasury yields lower. Okay. If it does that, then it will allow for re-expansion in multiples, which should actually benefit a lot of stocks. So we're not exactly sure. We're still digging in on, on the quantitative side of, th side of things here. But there is both good and bad in terms of market implications for what's going on in China. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears the bad is bigger than the good in terms of absolute value. But... That may not be the case, depending on how much of an impact this has on yields and how much that can result in some multiple expansion. So it's it, it, what you, if, you know, it's a give and take situation here, mm -hmm. and we're still trying to figure out how much give and how much take. Well, the good thing about this podcast is that we check in on this weekly, so I'm sure we'll continue our uh, observations of what's going on there uh, as we do with the Fed. So Fed still hawkish as ever. Uh, anything new to insights there? Yeah, so we, we think the market's due for a little flush out here, probably a 20% pullback, and then you get a, a big, a big meltup over the next 12 months. Um, and, the, and the thinking around that is the Fed. Mm -hmm. So Wall Street and the Fed sometimes agree, mm -hmm. sometimes disagree on monetary <laughs> policy. Mm -hmm. When they disagree, 
Wall Street oftentimes tries to send a message to the Fed through market action. Okay. And when that disagreement centers around the Fed being too hawkish and potentially spilling the economy into a recession, Mm -hmm. Wall Street sends the message to the Fed by sending stocks dramatically lower. Mm -hmm. We saw this in 2018. Mm -hmm. Early 2018, the Fed was pretty hawkish Mm -hmm. and Wall Street didn't like it. Stocks fell about 10% in early 2018. That was Wall Street trying to shake the Fed and say, hey, guys, stop hiking rates. Like, stop being so aggressive. The Fed didn't really listen to that. Throughout 2018, the U.S.-China trade war got worse. The economy started to slow. Trump started blaming the Fed for the economy not growing as quickly as it could. Mm -hmm. And the Fed didn't back down. The Fed stayed hawkish. They kept hiking rates. So finally, in the end of of 2018, um, Wall Street said enough is enough and put their foot down and sent stocks into a bear market. The Mm -hmm. S&P 500 dropped about 20%. NASDAQ dropped more than 20%. And what do you know? Right after that bear market caught the Fed's attention and the Fed shifted dovish in the early 2019 Mm -hmm. and we got a massive melt up in 2019 in stocks. We think history is repeating this time around. The Fed is hawkish. Wall Street tried to send a message in early 2022 saying, hey, Fed, back down. Not right. Really wrong move considering all the macroeconomic risk out there. You're going to hit a hard landing, not a soft landing. That's why we saw stocks pull back in January, February, and March. Then there was some hope in that second half March rebound that the Fed was going to listen and maybe pivot dovish or more dovish, less Mm -hmm. hawkish is perhaps the best term. (laughs) But the Fed did it. The Mm -hmm. Fed got more hawkish Mm -hmm. after that sell-off. So now Wall Street's like, okay, you want to play? Let's play. Mm -hmm. And when they say let's play, that means let's go to a bear market. Mm -hmm. Next stop, 20% down. So that means that's 20% retreat from all-time highs. That puts us another 10, 15% or 10% lower from where we currently are, depending on the index you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, you know, probably a 10% drawdown in May. Okay. And that will be Wall Street sending a message to the Fed. Hey, Fed, stop your stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's stop being super hawkish. Let's turn dovish and let's get the, the, you know, the, the train rolling again. Um, we think the Fed will listen. Uh-huh. We think the Fed is locked for a 50 bip hike in May. We think they're locked for a 50, big, 50 basis point hike in June. But we think by the summer, they're going to be looking at a much different picture than what they're looking at in May. Okay. And that picture is going to be a slowing economy. That picture is going to be decelerating inflation. That picture is going to be stocks that are either at, near, or coming off a bear market. And they're going to say, okay. Let's go dovish because Mm. this is a historically very dovish Fed. This is the same Fed that did listen to the markets in 2018 and went dovish as soon as stocks threw a temper tantrum. This is the same Fed that did throw the kitchen sink at the economy in early 2020 when COVID-19 hit. This is the same Fed that throughout 2021 when inflation was red hot did not want to hike rates for fear of slowing the economy. So this is an innately, inherently dovish Fed. Mm -hmm. And when they get the opportunity to pivot dovish they will pivot dovish they're going to get that opportunity this summer we think there's going to be a u-turn in federal reserve sentiment Mm -hmm. which is going to cause a u-turn in market risk sentiment which is going to spark a melt up in stocks over the subsequent 12 to 16 months so the way we see the market right now 10 percent drawdown probably a 25 30 percent rally Mm -hmm. Timing that, going to be very difficult. Stay long because the drawdown is going to be much smaller in magnitude than the melt up. Uh You're going to be up in 12 months. You're going to be up in 16 months. Stay long. Stay in the markets. We think that is – it's a really attractive sort of cycle we're going through right now. And to corroborate this, can you see my screen? Uh, I mean we can see it. I wouldn't say that it's – I can't read anything on it. I see the red and I see all the red. How about this? Can you see this? Oh, Mac computer bugging out. Can you see that? No. So describe it to us. For, for our it. audio listeners, Luke is trying to, I believe, show us a graph of... I can't see it. It's way too small. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a graph of the S&P 500. So okay. we've talked about the yield curve inversion before yes. on this yes. show. Mm -hmm. um, it's when the two-year treasury yield flips above the 10-year treasury yields, yield curve inversion. Mm -hmm. It's normally indicative or, or a precursor to a recession. But what a lot of people don't understand is that it's actually a precursor to market melt-up and then recession. Okay. That's the cycle. Okay? okay. So what you get normally is a yield curve inversion. Okay. Actually, not normally, every single time without fail. Okay. You get a yield curve inversion, mm -hmm. you get some choppy trading, mm -hmm. you get a melt up, and then you get a crash. Mm -hmm. That's the cycle every single time. Mm -hmm. And the chart I just pulled up is one of the 1988 inversion. Okay. That was the first time we saw a 10 2 inversion. Mm -hmm. What we got was some choppy trading for a month and then a. Wait, sorry, that's the 88 one. Where's the 78? <laughs> Oh, I closed the 78. Ugh. Well, again, we can't. Oh, well. our, our audio listeners can't see it, and I can barely see it. So, okay. Anyways, 1978, we had an inversion. Yep. We had some choppy trading. We yep. had a 13% melt up, and mm -hmm. then we had a crash. Um, 1988, we had some choppy inversion, choppy trading, 33% melt up, and then a recession and a crash. Um, 98, inversion, choppy trading. 39%, 40% melt up, mm -hmm. and then a recession and a crash. Mm -hmm. 05, choppy trading, 25% melt up, and then a recession and then a crash. Mm -hmm. 2019, choppy trading, 20% melt up, and then a recession and a crash. So five for five, perfect score. It happens time and 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 time again, and it's happening again right now. We're in the choppy trading phase. Mm -hmm. We probably have a little bit more choppy trading to go. Then we're going to get a big melt up, and then we're going to run into what will be a pretty scary period in the second half of 23. But between now and then, there is a lot of money to be made. Uh -huh. And that's why we think you should stay in the markets and heed signs, warning signs, not now, but in 12 months, mm -hmm. once people start forgetting about all the recession fears, once gotcha. people kind of throw caution to the wind, that's when you got to get scared. But right now, it's actually a pretty good time to be bullish. Awesome. Uh, with uh, our, in the last of our market check in with inflation, uh, PCE numbers come out on Friday. Any expectations there? Yeah, you got the PC deflator on Friday. That's the Fed's favorite number. That's going into the Fed meeting next week. It's going to be an important number. If mm -hmm. it's hot, you're probably going to see stocks get a big drawdown because you're going to get some pretty hawkish commentary the following week. If it's not hot, you'll probably get a big draw up, um, and that could you know lead to the Fed sounding less hawkish next week. So I'm not going to really predict where it's going to be because it's a really volatile number, <laughs> but it's a very important number. So let's let's sit by see and what watch happens it. on Friday. Got it. Uh, going into our crypto chicken. Uh, one of the things that kind of caught my attention, uh, whales are buying Bitcoin on dips below $40,000. Uh, is that a bit, is that a big deal? Yeah. I mean, it shows that there's a lot of accumulation. It shows mm -hmm. that people that are big believers, people that are long-term holders like Bitcoin below 40, mm -hmm. that's putting a floor in for Bitcoin. Bitcoin okay. is, is still in this nice little uptrend from January, 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really kind of collecting a lot of potential energy right now okay it's storing a lot of potential energy and so we think that we've seen a strong correlation between cryptos and risk assets cryptos and growth stocks mm -hmm. that once the fed does make this u-turn you're going to see a breakout in all risk assets bitcoin included cryptos included and the breakout in the crypto markets could be especially large because there appears to be a lot of potential energy there that's what the whale buying is the whale buying is a lot of potential energy coming okay. in waiting for this breakout and so we're pretty constructive on cryptos at the current moment pretty constructive on bitcoin not expecting an immediate melt up but we do think that the stage is set for what will be a pretty big 12 month rally over the next several or over the next 12 months obviously but we do think that the next three years actually look pretty good because we just have to get through 2022 <laughs> The reason being is there is a Bitcoin happening in 2024. Which we talked about March, last week. Yep. Yes, March 2024, there's a Bitcoin happening. And we talked about last week. Bitcoin tends to rally big in the 12 months before a Bitcoin happening mm -hmm. and in the 12 months after a Bitcoin happening. Mm -hmm. So happenings create two-year bull markets, 12 months before and 12 months after. Mm -hmm. That will take – so base, what we're saying is that because of the happening, March 23 to March 25 mm -hmm. should be a pretty good time for Bitcoin. So all we have to do right now is get to March 23. Mm -hmm. We think a Fed U-turn can get us to March 23. So let's say the Fed U-turns in July 22. Mm -hmm. Then 
We get the Fed rally from July 22 to March 23. Mm -hmm. We get the pre-happening rally from March 23 to March 24. Mm -hmm. And the post-happening rally from March 24 to March 25. So once the Fed U-turns, we could be looking at green shoots for the crypto market from, let's say, July 22 all the way to March 25. That's a pretty compelling three-year bull market. We think you got to be long cryptos right now. Awesome. Uh well, shifting into our fan questions uh, from Cardsend. Uh, this is a divergence question. Uh, with, Ooh, any yeah. large, with any large stock market, we have effectively multiple stock markets. Some will be showing diversion between earnings and price. Some will not. So yes, this makes complete sense if you're witnessing this phenomenon. But will this be able to carry the indices for all the others where the divergence is price staying up and earnings declining? Uh, great question. And no, it, it, it won't be. We're not, the divergence is not a, a market opportunity. The divergence is a single stock opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're talking about single stock opportunities in the market that are showing divergences that historically have created really compelling buying opportunities. And yet again, are creating another really compelling buying opportunity. So we're not saying this divergence phenomenon is the basis of a market melt up. Mm -hmm. We're saying this divergence phenomenon is the basis for some truly amazing generational single stock buying opportunities, not to mention the indices are entirely distorted because of the mega caps. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When you talk about the metas, the Amazons, the apples, the Microsofts, the Nvidia's, the alphabets, those mega caps comprise a overwhelming majority of the indices outside of the Dow. And so when you're looking at the S&P and you're looking at the NASDAQ, you're basically looking at those stocks. And those stocks are not showing massive divergences right now. Uh -huh. They just are not. Um, maybe meta a little bit, but that divergence is not large in the way that we're seeing in some of the smaller stocks out there. So uh -huh. no, I don't think the divergence phenomenon the existence of it means the markets are in great territory. Mm -hmm. It means that certain single stocks are There's super opportunities amazing there. buying opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. a stock market so much as it is a market of stocks. So that's why we're focusing on those single stock opportunities and not really the, the, the broader indices at the current moment. The divergence phenomenon is a single stock opportunity, not a market opportunity. Gotcha. Uh, friend of the show, Mia T, says, hello, Luke. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to Twitter stock price due to Elon Musk investing? Is Twitter the new Tesla? And what do you think is Elon's long-term plan for Twitter? Is it to decentralize and put Twitter on a blockchain on the blockchain? Okay. Um, yeah. So that uh, question was obviously from last week. Last since week. then, since yes, then, then, Twitter has accepted the yes. Elon buyout. So Elon is now um, going to take Twitter private at $54.20 a share. There's a little bit of an ARB opportunity there um, mm -hmm. between the current price and the buyout price. So it might be a good time to buy a Twitter stock and make a quick 5 6 7% there between um, now and the actual buyout. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the long-term vision for Elon, there's a couple implications here. So um, I actually just kind of wrote on this. And there's some some numbers here. I mean, the big implication for me is that it's time to go out and buy some social media stocks. Okay. Because there's two things here. The the Twitter buyout happened at 46 times uh, Twitter's 2023 estimated earnings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that is a massive multiple for the for a social media stock and far above what anybody else is getting. Snaps at 35 times 2023 estimated earnings. Pinterest is at 15 times 2023 estimated earnings. Facebook is at 13 times 2023 estimated earnings. Mm -hmm. So Twitter's at 46. The buyout's at 46. And Twitter's growing EPS around 30% per year. Snap's at 60%. Pinterest is at 30%. Facebook's at 20%. So if anything, it's a right middle of the pack grower, mm -hmm. yet it's being given a huge valuation premium. So on that multiple basis alone, it looks like the other social media stocks are pretty cheap probably worth getting into the second thing the second reason i'm really bullish on social media stocks is that i think social media companies those ones in, in particular are going to earn a bigger share of the digital ad revenue pie twitter's mm -hmm. digital ad revenue share is going to decrease okay and it's going to decrease for a couple reasons one elon is all this is a free speech free speech play for elon mm -hmm. right he's all about free speech and that's fantastic, and I support that, and mm -hmm. I think they're, 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 that's a valiant effort. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that, from a business perspective, is brands don't want 
that to happen because <laughs> free speech means I can say hateful comments. I can say certain things. I can, I can say whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And as a brand, if I'm advertising on that platform, I now run the risk of my advertisement being juxtaposed next to maybe a hateful comment, mm -hmm. maybe something that rubs people the wrong way, mm -hmm. maybe something that I don't necessarily want my brand to be advertised next to. So the free speech platform, I love it. Elon is going to do a great job with it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But certain brands are going to pull advertising from Twitter or at least reduce advertising on Twitter mm -hmm. to protect brand equity. And therefore, they're not going to take that money and go into linear TV. They're going to take that money and go into Snapchat, Pinterest, mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, la di da la di do So we think that that is a huge tailwind for the social stocks. And then another thing is that Elon is, is not familiar with the digital advertising model and has made it very clear that he likes the subscription model. Uh -huh. So you could see Twitter, as it goes private, take a stronger emphasis on making a subscription business as opposed to digital advertising business, which would decrease probably the, the volume of digital ad inventory on the platform, uh -huh. which naturally would force advertisers to pull spend and go to the other platforms as well. So we actually think the news is really positive for other social media stocks um and is a big reason to buy snap and pinterest in particular we really like those stocks at these levels as far as is twitter the next tesla um no <laughs> twitter's a social media platform um elon has his work cut out uh when it comes to twitter mm -hmm. i think the platform does have some compelling long-term value but truth be told it's, it's going to be very difficult mm -hmm. very difficult for um Elon to make Twitter this massive success story. I think the plan there is probably to take it private, make some changes, pioneer this subscription model, mm -hmm. make a better business, and then come back public at a higher valuation in three or four years. Mm -hmm. That's probably mm -hmm. Elon's plan. Will he succeed? Remains to be seen. Uh, but in the meantime, the way we can make money off it, I think, is by buying uh, other social media stocks. Uh, our last question comes from CS Lowe. Uh, kind of tail doving off of our uh, real estate conversation with mortgage demand dropping, mortgage rates rising, home purchase demand pulling back, et cetera. How will all these affect open in the near in the near to midterm, if any? Thank you. All right. Yeah. So open will get hit on fears and then it'll rebound when those fears prove completely irrational. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty pretty much that simple I, i've explained in, in depth in this podcast why yeah. i think the housing market's on rock solid footing mm -hmm. and be careful when you read those the mortgage demand is dropping be really careful with that headline because mm -hmm. cnbc bloomberg and others love to throw out that headline that mortgage applications are down mm -hmm. 20 30 percent read the subtext because mm -hmm. It's actually refinancing that's down like 50%. Okay. New home mortgage applications are only down like 8 9%. Mm -hmm. It's a very small drop in new home. New home sales dropped 10% year over year uh, last month. So, and prices were up 17%. So, on a on a revenue basis, you know, you can say it nets out to plus 7. So, the fact the the headline that mortgage application volume is crashing, it is, but it's refinance application volume that's crashing. New home application buying demand uh -huh. not really crashing all that much. In fact, it's it's still pretty strong, and I guarantee you, <laughs> I guarantee you as soon as this market does start to slow and it will home prices are going to stop rising 70 percent year over year that's not sustainable as soon as we get into a four to five percent cadence or god forbid we go flat mm -hmm. waves waves of demand mm -hmm. will roll into the market and you're going to get big price appreciation big sales gain so open door stock is completely fine okay. completely fine no need to worry about it and even if the market does crash let's play out the bear scenario okay even if the market does crash, housing markets historically take forever to crash. This is mm -hmm. not like the stock market. Yeah. Stock market, high liquid assets. You can go up 10%, down 10%, like, <laughs> zooming. Mm -hmm. You can see the stock market crash 50% in a year. Mm -hmm. Home prices move like a freaking snail. <laughs> okay? I mean, they'll go down 1% a month, 2% a month. Even during the worst crash of all time, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. the reason I just said four years is because it took four years for home prices to fall from peak to trial. Mm -hmm. Right? They, they peaked out in 2005. 
And then they just kind of gradually fell over the course of four years. So the market's really slow moving. That benefits open door and all I buyers because these guys flip on a 90 day basis. Mm -hmm. Prices don't change that much on a 90 day basis. Okay. I get it. If, if, if home prices did change significantly from January to March, from February to July, or not July, sorry, that's five months, but you get the point. On a rolling 90-day basis, mm -hmm. home prices don't change that much. So Open Door is shielded because what they buy on day zero, they sell before day 90, meaning that if the market does fall, let's say home prices fall 20%, mm -hmm. they're going to fall 20% over the course of two or three years. Mm -hmm. What Open Door is going to feel is just 0.5%, 0.5%, 0.5%, tiny little stuff. Their models will adjust. They'll be under buying. They'll look at good prices. So Open Door is completely fine. Don't worry about the housing crash. The stock is completely dirt cheap at these levels. Because of concerns related to that, the market just does not understand Open Door. And that's my opportunity because mm -hmm. the market didn't understand Amazon in 2001. Market didn't understand Salesforce in 07. Market didn't understand Microsoft in 89. We think Open Door is a generational type opportunity here. Housing crash or not, stock's a great buy. Well, as always, another great discussion. Uh, any last words before we wrap? I'm looking at the clock right now. We went an hour and 15, Aaron. We, we oh, went, yeah, we went, <laughs> we went a little above and beyond today. Uh, and I'm so, operating on three hours of sleep. I don't know how I did that. I know, Ooh. crazy. Hey, you know what? It's all that research that makes these podcasts so awesome for all our listeners and we want to thank everybody for listening uh if you have any questions or comments for luke we love to hear them in our comment section any feedback any topics you want us to cover any to see if we can answer any of your burning questions uh, until then please don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you next week bye all